uh, thank you for your very kind invitation to come to you today. And before I forget, I must pass on the greetings of uh, Zion Evangelical Baptist Church, and they send their regards and their prayers for you. Well, as we come to worship, I just want to read to you um, a couple of verses from the Psalms. It's a Psalm 92, which is a psalm or a song for the Sabbath day, and it says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness every night. He says, Upon an instrument of ten strings, and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. Well, let's come before the Lord in prayer and let's seek his face together. Let's pray. Our loving and most glorious Father in heaven, we come to thee this morning and we bow before thee. Thou art the great God, one who is uh, greatly to be praised and whose greatness is unsearchable. And we come and we bow before thee, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, And we acknowledge that we come before a God who is almighty, one who is worthy of our praise and of our honour and of our glory. Lord, there is none like thee in heaven or in earth. There is none, Lord, who can compare to thee, the one who is the great creator of the ends of the earth. And so, Father, we come humbly, we come reverently, we come fearfully this morning But Lord, we thank Thee that we've been reminded in that psalm that it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, to sing Thy praises, to show forth Thy loving kindness every morning and Thy faithfulness every night. And so, Father, we come with that very purpose this morning, to sing Your praises, to lift up Your name, to glorify the God who has made us, the one who sustains us and cares for us. And so, Father, we pray that Thou would be with us this morning and bless us, that we would know Thy presence, that we would know the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that we would be enabled to truly worship Thee in spirit and in truth. Father, help us, we pray. Be with us, be near to us. May we know Thy blessing and Thy hand of grace upon us. Bless us in every part of this service, in the singing of the hymns, in the reading of Thy precious words, in the preaching of thy word. Father, every part, we pray that the name of Jesus Christ would be magnified, that we would decrease and that he would increase, and that, Father, all glory would be given to thee. Help us then, Father, we pray. Forgive us for our many sins, for we ask all these mercies in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Remember, we're going to take up our hymn books and sing our first hymn this morning, which is based on that psalm that I read. It's hymn number 64. Hymn number 64, sweet is the work, my God, my King, to praise your name, give thanks and sing, to show your love by morning light and talk of all your truth at night. Hymn number 64.
you have a, a Bible with you this morning, please turn with me for our Old Testament reading to Psalm 91. If you have a, a church Bible, that's found on page 530. Psalm 91. And we'll read the whole of this psalm together. Let's hear the word of God. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. We trust the Lord that his blessing to that reading of his holy and inspired word. We're going to take up our hymn books and sing our second hymn this morning. Hymn number 612, 612. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. And uh, there's uh, so many uh, scripture references in this hymn. It's a wonderful hymn. But uh, I love verse 6, particularly the soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. We'll stand 612.
Well, again, if you have a Bible with you, uh, please turn with me for a New Testament reading to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and that's found on page 1041. Now, uh, the boys and girls here, especially as we read this, I think you'll find this passage interesting because it's about a soldier, and it's about what a soldier wears. And uh, I don't know about you, but I like battles, particularly if you're a boy here, I'm sure you like reading about battles and fighting. And here, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing, he's talking about a Roman soldier. And as we read it, listen to the different pieces of armor that Paul mentions here. We're going to read from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, and we'll read down to verse 18. Let's hear the, the word of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Amen. Again, we trust all those blessing to that reading of his holy word. Now, boys and girls, I have something with me. Um, now, usually when I talk to boys and girls, I usually have something big so you can see, but unfortunately the thing I've got today with me is very small and I can't make it bigger because it wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't small, if that makes sense. And I've got two of them here, and maybe you'd like to come and see them afterwards, because I don't really want to give them to you, because you'll find out why I can't give them to you in a moment. Now, can you sort of see that? It looks like a little bit of fluff, doesn't it, if, you, if you've been to Specsavers and you've got your glasses on. Can you see that? It looks like a little bit like... a. I don't know what it looks like, really. Here, what about this one? This one's a bit more colourful. Can you see that? Okay. Now, do you think you know what that is? It's a bit tricky, isn't it? Do the adults know what it is? Can you see what that is? It's a bit tricky, isn't it? Look, I'll show you this bit here. It's very colourful. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what this is. I heard somebody, I think, maybe talking a bit about this before I came in. This is what a fisherman uses to catch fish. Okay, this is what they call a fly. Have you ever heard of that? Have you ever heard of fly fishing, boys and girls? Have you heard of that? Well, what fishermen do, they put this on the end of a a line and they stand in the river and they cast out and they use this to try and catch fish. And the idea is that this looks like a particular kind of fly and the fish, they love these different kinds of fly and they come up and they try and bite it And what happens when the fish bites the fly? Can you tell me what happens? What happens? Yes. The fish gets caught, yes, because I'm actually holding it there by something that's curled round. What do you call the bit that's curled round that catches the fish? Yes. A hook, hook, that's right. That's why I didn't want to give them to you, because these hooks are quite sharp and... uh, They've got barbs on the end, and the idea is that when the fish bites it, the hook can't come out of its mouth, and if that got into your, your finger, it would really hurt. And, but you know, I was thinking about this um, as we were thinking about our readings. Do you know that Satan is a bit like a fisherman? 
Satan is like a very clever fisherman because what he does is he likes to make, as it were, flies, things that look very attractive and are very appealing to us as humans. And he wants us to fall into sin. He wants us to do bad things and wrong things. And he makes it look so, oh, just like the fly does to a fish. Oh, that's wonderful. But when we sin, there's a curled bit at the end of it, a hook. And what happens to the fish when it's caught, boys and girls? What does the fisherman do? Fly fishermen do anyway, not people who do sport fishing. What do the fly fishermen often do with a fish once they've caught it? Yes, they kill it and they take it home and they eat it. If they've caught a nice trout or a nice salmon or something, they say, oh, that's my supper, okay? And Satan, when he catches us in our sin, the Bible tells us that sin, the soul that sins, it will die. And the wages of sin is death. And Satan makes sin seem so wonderfully attractive. And yet at the end of it, there's a hook that catches us. And Satan's a master fisherman. Do you know when a fisherman uh, goes out fishing, he selects just the right kind of fly for that day, for that season, for that weather conditions. He says, well, I think the trout are going to go for this one today and not my other one. So I'm going to put that one on because that's the one that's going to catch the fish today. And Satan does that with us. He's our enemy. He's the enemy of your soul. And he wants to catch you. And he puts out different things for you so that you'll sin and you'll be tempted. You know, boys and girls, every time we sin, there's a hook. And Satan loves to have us. And that's why we need a saviour. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ came. It was to deal with sin and to save us from our sin. To save us from Satan. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ did that when he died upon the cross at Calvary. And he shed his precious blood. He came to save us from our sin. And so, boys and girls, I want you to remember that because in a moment when we come to our, uh, think about our, a sermon, we're going to think a little bit about Satan. But I want you to remember that, boys and girls. Satan is your enemy. And he wants you to sin. But sin leads to death. But thanks be to God, the Lord Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And I hope and trust and pray that all you boys and girls know him as your saviour. And you love him and trust him and serve him. Well, we're going to come before the Lord in prayer. Let's seek his face once more. Let's pray and ask God to help us. Our loving and gracious Father in heaven, we acknowledge that indeed we have a great enemy, one who is like a roaring lion that goes about seeking whom he may devour. Father, we acknowledge that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Lord, we are in a, a battle against the forces of wickedness, and, Father, we confess as we look back over the week that's just been how often we failed Thee, how often we have come short of Thy glory, how often we have fallen into sin, and Satan has tempted us, and we've succumbed, and we come before Thee, Father, and we acknowledge our sin before Thee. We acknowledge just how awful and how desperately wicked our hearts are, but Father, we thank Thee for the Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we come to Thee. We thank Thee for His death at Calvary. We thank Thee for that great truth that He shed His precious blood and it's through that blood that we can be washed and cleansed of our every spot and stain. And so Father, we come this morning and we pray, cleanse us afresh in that blood. Renew that right spirit within us. May we be those, Lord, who walk closely with Thee. Help us as Thy people, Father, to be those who neither veer to the right nor to the left, but we plough that straight furrow, that we would be those, Father, who uh, in every part of our lives would honour Thee and glorify Thy name. Father, we acknowledge, Lord, that we need Thy help. Oh, Lord, we pray for the Spirit's leading and guiding day by day. Father, as we uh, go to work, as we perhaps stay at home, Father, as we talk to our neighbours, as we go to school, Lord, whatever sphere of influence we have, Father, we pray that we would be those who put on the whole armour of God, that we'd be those who walk circumspectly, that we would be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would be salt and light in this dark and decaying generation. 
Oh, Heavenly Father, we look out across our land and it grieves our hearts to see so much sin. It grieves our hearts to see so many just pursuing the things of this world. No care for their soul. No thought for eternity. No love for Thee. Oh, Father, we pray that Thou would have mercy upon us as a nation. We think particularly of this area around Dewsbury. We think of this area of West Yorkshire and North Yorkshire, and we think of just as our land as a whole. Oh, Father, we see so many who are heading uh, straight to an eternity without Christ, without God, without hope. Oh, Father, we pray that Thou would pour out Thy Spirit in these days, that Thou would raise up godly men who would preach the truth, who would preach it in season, out of season, who would proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we see the harvest is white, it's plenteous, but the laborers are few. But Father, we thank Thee for the command to pray for more laborers. And so Father, we pray particularly today, Lord, for this day, the Lord's Day, that as the Word is preached and proclaimed here and throughout the world, Father, we pray, bless it. Pray that there would be many who would hear the eternal word of life, that they would hear of Christ, they would hear of his death, hear of his burial, hear of his glorious resurrection, and that, Father, thou would convict sinners of their sin and draw them to that Savior. Oh, Lord, we long for many to come to faith in Jesus Christ, that they would cry out, what must I do to be saved? Oh, so, Father, we pray, work in these days. We pray for the churches in this area, those who faithfully uphold the word of God, that thou would bless them, that thou would bring many in, that thou would bless the word as it's preached today, that it would not be with the enticing words of man's wisdom, that it would not be merely by the flesh, but Father, we pray that the preaching of the word would come in power and in demonstration of the spirits, and that thy people would know that they've met with thee, and that thou would sanctify thy people through thy truth. Oh, we lift up these things to thee, Father. We thank thee that we have a great God. We thank thee that you hear and answer our prayers. Lord, what a privilege to come into thy presence. What a privilege to come before the one who's made us and loves us, the one who sent his only begotten son into this world. So, Father, we thank thee for these things. We pray too, Lord, for those who've gone away from uh, these shores into other lands where there is perhaps great hostility to the gospel, where there is perhaps very few who know thee and love thee, perhaps places, Lord, where there is great persecution, where to even speak of Jesus Christ or to own a Bible would bring the threat of imprisonment or death or banishment from family life. Oh, Father, we pray for such believers today that thou would comfort them and draw alongside them, that they would know that assurance from thy words, that thou would help them, that, Father, that even in such difficult circumstances, thou would help them to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ and to uphold his name. Oh, we pray, Father, in such places, may thy word increase. And, Lord, may you do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Oh, we pray particularly, Lord, for those who are caught up in Islam, and they are following that false religion. Oh, we pray, Lord, that thou would take them out of such spiritual darkness, open their eyes, that they would see the wonder of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, we bring these things to thee now. Father, we pray for ourselves, even as we come around thy word, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, whatever our circumstances, whatever our difficulties and trials, whatever things, Lord, have happened in the past week, we pray that thy word would speak to us now. We pray that you would remove all the distractions and that, Father, that we would focus upon thee. We ask, Lord, that even now you would lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. May he have the preeminence. For we ask all these mercies in his wonderful and glorious name. Amen. I remember we're going to sing before we come to God's word, hymn number 760, 760. Oft in danger, oft in woe, onward Christians, onward go. Fight the fight, maintain the strife, strengthened with the bread of life. 716.
Well, please uh, turn with me this morning in your Bibles to the book of James and to chapter 4. James chapter 4. And I want to draw your attention just to one verse in this chapter. To be even more specific, I want to draw your attention to one part of one verse. James chapter 4 and verse 7 and the last part of the verse where we read this, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And my title for this morning, our subject this morning is the spiritual fight. The spiritual fight. You know, when the uh, apostle Paul wrote his first letter to Timothy, He sought to encourage him, he sought to exhort him, this young man. And you remember how he says there in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Paul knew that the Christian life, that our pilgrimage as we press on towards our heavenly home, Paul knew that this life was a battle and it was a fight. Not a physical battle, not a not a fight with our physical hands using literal weapons, but Paul knew that the Christian life is a spiritual battle, a battle that requires spiritual weapons. It's a battle over our souls. We have an enemy, as we were thinking with the boys and girls, we have a fierce foe, and so Paul writes, fight the good fight of faith. And here in James chapter 4, Uh, And in this seventh verse, James picks up this uh, same sort of pictures of the spiritual battle and the fight. And so he says to the readers here, he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And the language that he uses in this chapter is all military language. The whole passage from uh, verse 1 is using metaphors that are drawn from the sphere of conflict and army life. Just look at verse 1, for for example. James chapter 4, verse 1, he speaks of wars and fightings. In verse 2, he speaks about killing. In verse 4, he uses this word enmity. He says the friendship of the world is enmity with God. And the word he uses there is a very strong word. Literally, it's one who takes up opposition, who's a foe, who's an enemy, someone who wages war. He says, if you are friends of the world, you are, as it were, a soldier fighting against God. In verse 6, he speaks about uh, resisting. He says, God resisteth the proud. And again, that's a military term in the Greek. It means to draw up battle. You are, God literally fights against you if you are proud. He actively opposes you. And then in verse 7 at the beginning, he uses the word submit. That's the very opposite in the Greek to to, uh, resisting. And again, it's a military term. It's the submitting of a soldier under a captain. There's the captain, he gives the order, and the soldier obeys it without question and does it because he's in authority. He says, submit yourselves therefore to God. And so all the way through this, Uh, passage, James is using military language, and then he comes to verse 7 and he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And he's picking up this language again of conflict, and it's a reminder to us as believers of the conflict that we are engaged in. And it's this conflict that I want us to consider this morning. And it's my prayer that as we do so, we would be encouraged to continue in the battle, to not lose hearts, to not give in or to give up in this spiritual fight, to not grow disheartened, but rather to press on as we seek to fight the good fight of faith. And so as we think of this subject this morning of the spiritual fight, I just want to consider three things with you from this verse. And the first of these things is the foe. The foe. Because James reminds us here that as Christians, we have a foe. We have an enemy as we were talking a moment ago, we, he says there in verse 7, resist the devil. Resist the devil. Now the devil is a fallen archangel. The devil is unholy. The devil is opposed to God. And therefore he's opposed to all of God's 
children. He is the believer's foe. If you are a Christian here this morning, Satan is your foe. Now, I, I think this is something that we need to be reminded of more and more in these days, because it seems to me that it's become less fashionable in uh, Christian circles to talk about the devil. It's become a bit of a, a taboo subject because it's a negative subject. We rather would speak of God's grace, we would rather speak of his love, we would rather think about all the blessings that we have in Christ, in heavenly places. We don't want to focus on the fact that we have an adversary called Satan that he's wandering up and down this earth, that he's walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. It's unpopular. But I want to remind you, Christian, here this morning, that we have this foe, and he's a formidable foe. He's a dangerous foe. And this foe is a powerful foe. He's powerful. And I want to just think about this with you for a moment here. He's powerful. We could illustrate this in lots of ways from Scripture. For example, if we were to look at some of the titles that are given to the devil. Christ, for example, calls the devil on three occasions in John's Gospel. He calls him the prince of this world. He says that in John 12, 31, John 14, verse 30, and in chapter 16 and verse 11, he's the prince of this world. Now, a prince possesses a degree of authority, a degree of power. They wield a degree of influence. And Jesus says that Satan, as the prince, he's the prince of this world. So he holds a degree of power, a degree of authority over the earth and over the people of this earth. Christ, of course, is the one who possesses all power, absolute power. Power, he's king of kings, isn't he? Lord of lords. But nevertheless, Satan possesses a great degree of power. And it's a power that Satan uses and he abuses, and he's done that for centuries. You know, before Christ came into the world, Satan held sway over much of the earth. Most people, most nations, they were utterly taken over by idolatry and, and false worship, and they were in darkness. But Christ, you know, has cast him out. Remember we read that in John's Gospel. He's done that through the work of the cross. He's stripped him in a sense of a large part of his dominion. But nevertheless, Satan is still powerful. He still holds sway in many, many people's hearts. You know, unbeliever this morning, if you're not a Christian here this morning, uh, Satan holds sway in your hearts. He controls you. You are his slave. He is your master. What you need is a saviour to liberate you, to save you, to set you free. Sinner this morning, only Christ can set you free from Satan. Only Christ can deliver you from the destructive power and the tyranny of the devil. You need to turn to him. But moving on from that title this morning, we could also note that Paul uses a similar one in Ephesians 2. He describes Satan as the prince of the power of the air. That's an interesting title that he gives him there. A moment ago we said he had a degree of authority over the earth, but Paul now tells us he has a degree of authority over the air, over the influence of the air. And we could say, well, what does Paul mean when he uses this title about the air? Well, the air is where the devils and the fallen angels fly and move. It's where his lieutenants and his minions will gather to oppose God's people and the church. And so Paul is reminding us that Satan has a power over a vast host of devils and wicked angels that are out to harm the believer. Satan has a, a huge and vast and powerful army who are willing to do his bidding. And this is further highlighted by the other titles in the scripture. You think of the title Beelzebub. That means the prince of devils. We need to remind ourselves, for instance, that there's a whole unseen world out there of spirits and devils, of principalities and powers, of rulers of the darkness of this world that we read about in, in, in uh, our passage earlier in Ephesians 6. And they're arrayed, believer, in battle against your soul. Do you see, friends, how powerful Satan is? Remember, Christ describes him as a strong man armed. You know, also that in Revelation 9 and verse 11, he's called Apollyon, which means the destroyer. 
Christian, that's what he would love to do to you. He'd love to destroy you. Satan's out to, to destroy you, kill you. But we can think about how this power is shown in other ways too. Think of the different animals that are used to describe Satan. Think of Genesis chapter 3. Satan's described there. He comes in the form of a serpent. Serpents are known for being deadly, aren't they? They either constrict their prey or they inject deadly poison to kill their prey. Satan is like a serpent. He's also described as a dragon. And that was like a large serpent beast or monster. He's a monster who possesses strength. Satan's also described as a lion. Remember that passage in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 where he says, Be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You know, the lion in scripture represents the king of beasts, the, the king of the forest. The lion's an animal that possesses strength. They would have struck fear into the heart of a person who came across one. They look great in a zoo, don't they? But imagine meeting one walking down the streets. It's a frightening prospect. You know, they're not uh, a cuddly things, are they, lions, really? It would have struck fear into your heart if you met one. Peter says, that's what our adversary, the devil, is like. He's like a roaring lion, and he walks about seeking whom he may devour. Believer, Satan would take you down and tear you into little pieces and devour you if he could. And friends, we haven't even begun this morning to describe just how subtle he is how wily he is, how crafty he is, his deception. We thought a little bit about with the boys and girls. As a fisherman, he's so crafty, he's so subtle. You know, we're told about he, he uses fiery darts, he uses snares, he uses all deceivableness of unrighteousness. You know, he can disguise himself as an angel of light. And he's also the father of lies. And of all his vast experience, he can, seem, he can make sin seem just so attractive. Make it seem so pleasurable, so profitable. And yet, there's always that hook, there's always that poison. Believe it, do you see, this is what we're up against. We're up against Satan. And we have to say, not only is he powerful, but we have to know that he's a personal foe too. James says here, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Satan attacks individuals. He attacks individual believers. There's course times when he may strike a church or he may seek to take down a Christian family or a Christian marriage. But Satan loves to go on the offensive against individuals. Again, Scripture gives us so many examples of this. We read the devil uh, tempted the Lord Jesus Christ. We read that Satan entered Judas. He desired to have Peter. The Apostle Paul speaks of how Satan hindered him in his work. See, he targeted certain people at certain times. And believe it, there may be days when he particularly comes for you. That's why James gives this exhortation here in verse 7. Because Satan will come. You know, I remember when I was a, a young boy going to church and we used to have an elderly gentleman used to come to the church where, we used to, where I used to go as a boy. And I remember him once saying, do you know, uh, boys and girls, the devil's real? And he said, you may ask, well, how do I know the devil's real? He said, I'll give you two answers. He said, number one, because the Bible tells me so. And he said, number two, because I meet him every day. And that struck me. Believe it, do you realize that? The devil's out to get you. He's out to tempt you, he's out to snare you, he's out to catch you. Friends, we have a powerful and we have a personal foe. But I want to move on from that. We've seen the foe here, but notice secondly with me the fight. The fight. James says here in verse 7, he says, resist the devil. And that word, as we said earlier, that word resist, it's a military term, it's used of an army. An army that's taken up its arms, it's ordered in battalions and in units. They're dressed for battle, they're armed, they're ready to fight. And James says here, this is what we've got to do against our foe, the devil. We are to resist him. 
We are not to reason with him. We're not to stand there and seek some kind of truce or compromise with the devil. Rather, we're to stand and fight. We're to be ready like an active soldier on duty. And so he says here, resist the devil. Now, remember what we said at the beginning. This is not a physical fight, but it's a spiritual one. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, as we said earlier, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Friends, it would be much easier if it was a physical fight, but it's not. And that's why Paul told the Christians that we are to walk in the flesh. Even though we walk in the flesh, he says, we do not war after the flesh. No, he says to the Christians in Corinth, he says, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. No, we're in a spiritual fight with a spiritual foe. And the the devil loves to come at us in different ways, doesn't he? He loves to attack us from every angle. He'll seek to oppose us from every every side. He'll, He'll attack us when we least expect it. He'll do it in ways that we never saw coming. James in this passage actually mentions some of the uh, ways that the devil likes to attack. He talks here in verse 1 about lusts. There's an area where the devil loves to get us. The word lust there is speaking of strong desires, of sensual gratification. It can be applied to any kind of desire. Desire for things, desire for pleasure, desires for experiences. What's being spoken of here is a desire for something sinful that flows from a a covetous or a, a jealous heart. It's a desire to gratify ourselves. And Satan loves to attack us in this way. That's what our that's just how advertising works, isn't it? Oh, you surely you want this. Go for this. Do not desire this. And he loves to pull out of our lusts. It's the way Moses was attacked, wasn't it, when he was in Pharaoh's palace. Satan sought to tempt him with all the enjoyment of the passing pleasures of sin. He sought to tempt him with the riches of Egypt, but Moses resisted. I wonder if you've ever been tempted into lust of any kind, friends. Maybe it's a a sexual lust or lust for the things of this world. James says, resist, fight it. James also mentions the sin that flows out of the sixth commandment in verse 2. He speaks about killing. Murder flows from hatred for others. Hatred in your hearts. Seeking to put others down and elevate yourself. Believer, have you ever been attacked by Satan in this way? Where hatred begins to well up in your heart for someone? You begin to laugh at them unkindly. You talk behind their back. You put them down in some way. You get involved in a little bit of character assassination with somebody. You talk about somebody who's not there. James says, look, when that kind of sin comes, resist it. Fight it. You go down into verse 4. He speaks about friendship of the world. Loving this world. Loving its ideologies, its thinking, its ideas, its maxims. Loving its amusements. You know, friends, this morning I think as Christians, this is an area where we need to be so, so careful today. We need to be on our guard against this particularly. The church and God's people are to be distinct and separate from the world. Let me ask you this morning, are we? When people look at our lives, do they just see a worldly person who's pursued with all and loving the things of this world? Do they see someone who's distinct? Someone whose eyes is fixed upon a heavenly home, not this world which is decaying and and going to go to and be burnt up by fire? James says here, friendship of the world is enmity with God. We're to resist. Friends, do you listen to the same programs that all the sinners and unbelievers listen to? Do you watch the same things? Are you consumed with this world? You know, I think too many churches today and too many Christians, the lines have become so blurred. You can walk into a church and walk out of it and you can't see the difference between the world and the church. Friends, it's not an easy fight, but we have to fight these things, resist these things. It's an intense struggle. James goes on and gives us another area where we're to resist. He warns us in verse 6, for example, of pride. 
You know, the Puritans used to call pride the shirt of the soul. They used to say, because it's the first thing you put on in the morning and the last thing you take off at night. Is that true of you, believer? Are you someone who so often wells up in pride at your achievements and what you've done? You know, pride is one of the worst sins, isn't it? Other sins draw our hearts away from God, but pride lifts it up against God. You know, pride continually festers, doesn't it, in our hearts. We're so often so pleased with what we've done, but James says, resist, humble yourselves, he says, under the mighty hand of God. Do you see, believer, this morning we're in this battle, we're in this fight. We could just go on listing sin after sin after sin that we need to resist, that we need to fight against. We may say to ourselves, well, well, where do we begin in this fight? And if you look at the beginning of the verse, verse 7, we're told to submit ourselves to God. God deserves, doesn't he, our willing and spontaneous subjection. If we want to win in the fight against Satan, then we need to yield our hearts and our minds and our wills, our whole beings over to God. We're to submit to his way, to his word, to his works. And part of that subjection to his word, for example, is to follow his precepts, follow his commands. In the fight against sin, we're we're seeking to resist the devil. And as we were reading earlier, we need to put on that whole armor of God. We're to stand there, aren't we, uh, with our loins girt about with truth. We need the breastplate of righteousness. We need our feet shod with the, the preparation of the gospel of peace and so on. Wearing the helmet of salvation. We need to pick up the shield of faith in one hand and the sword, that word of God, the sword of the Spirit in the other. We need to have on the whole armour of God. You remember when the devil was tempting Christ, what was it that Christ used? It was the sword of the Spirit, wasn't it? He resisted the devil by saying, it is written. And that sent Satan scurrying away. You know, in that passage, we're encouraged at the end, aren't we, to be praying always of all prayer. Prayer is what helps us buckle on the armour. Friends, if we wish to be successful in resisting the devil, then we need the spiritual armour of God. Somebody gave me a practical tip once about this, and I think it was a very useful piece of advice. And he says to me, do you know, there's seven pieces of armour in the spiritual armour there in Ephesians chapter 6. You have the six pieces and then you have praying always of all prayer. He says there's seven. And he says, well, there's seven uh, days in a week. And so he says, in your quiet time every morning, pray for one of each of those seven pieces of armour. So start, for example, on Monday and pray for that uh, breastplate of righteousness or pray for the, the, uh, your loins to be girt about with truth and then on Tuesday pray for the next one on Wednesday pray for the next one and it helps you to keep these things in your mind so you're always putting on the armour of God. Friends, let me encourage you to do that in your quiet times. Pray, Lord, help me to put on the armour of God. Well, we've seen then this morning the foe We've seen the fight, but I want you to notice lastly and very quickly the flight. The flight. Because James says here, resist the devil and he will flee from you. See, having given this exhortation to resist, having given this command to resist and fight against our foe, he now adds this wonderful affirmation here because he says he will flee. This will absolutely happen if you resist. It's certain. It's, it's sure. It's a, it's a promise that comes from God. You notice it's a conditional promise that comes from God. He says, look, every time you resist the devil, he will surely flee and he will run and he will scurry. Now, friends, he may only flee for a short, short season. He may only flee to gather more foot soldiers and more devils to oppose you. He may only flee to re- regroup and form a, a new and different attack, but he will flee. Satan loves to vex us. Yes, he loves to oppose us. He loves to annoy us. Paul knew all about this, didn't he? Remember, he had the thorn in the flesh, which he prayed three times to be removed. But he was given the answer that God's grace is sufficient. And Paul knew at times, didn't he, what it was to fail in this fight. Remember in Romans 7, he cries, Oh, wretched man that I am. He knew that internal struggle at times. 
But friends, that doesn't mean that we give up. I know at times you can look back at the end of the day, I wonder if you do this, believer, you look back at the end of the day and all you can see is your failures, all you can see is the sins you fell into and you think, how did I fall into that sin again? But we're encouraged here, the next day, resist the devil. And we can beat ourselves up, can't we? That we, we just haven't done what the Lord has asked us to do. But this affirmation here should also act as our motivation. Look, he will flee, therefore resist. Is this a promise? Well, friends, this morning let me encourage you to press on in the fight of faith, to fight this good fight of faith. Seek God's help and grace. Put on the whole armour of God. Stand against the wiles of the devil. Resist him at all costs. It's for the good of your soul. Satan may fly temporarily and he may regroup, he may come back, yes, but there's coming a day, isn't there, when sin, as we sang, our worst enemy before, shall vex our eyes and ears no more. There is coming a day, believer, when the fight will be over. And instead of having on, holding that sword and having the helmet of salvation, we'll have a crown of glory. Friends, there is coming a day when we will be triumphant. But until that day, resist, resist, fight. This is a spiritual battle. You know, when we finally get to glory, that will be a day when Satan will never be able to get near us again. He won't be able to ensnare us. He won't be able to tempt us. He won't be able to trip us up. There'll be no more, uh, in, when we get to heaven, there'll be no more standing there and thinking, how did I fall into that sin again? It'll all be over. And we'll put down our sword and we'll receive that crown of glory and then we shall know fully, won't we, and completely that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. But until that day, believer, fight. Resist. And may you know the assurance of this promise here, that when you resist the devil, he will flee from you. And I pray and trust that God would write his word on our hearts this morning. And help each one of us, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, to resist the devil so that he may flee from us. And as we close our service this morning, let's sing our final hymn, hymn number 749, 749. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armour on, strong in the strength which God supplies through his Eternal Son, 749 will stand as we sing.
unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen.